algebra students, let's talk about the standard form of polynomials. One of the struggles that students really commonly have, they message me about or ask me about all the time, is not being sure how to tell if their answer is really wrong if it looks different than mine or if it's just another way to say the same thing. And usually you guys lean on the side of it must be wrong. I must be wrong if my answer doesn't look just like Kate's. And this happens with fractions and decimals. That's a common place. But here's another common place with polynomials. And if this looks really scary to you, what you're seeing here in this black circle, don't worry. What we're going to do with these is just a really simple thing. Okay. You're going to be okay. Here we go. So I got a question here from a student on YouTube posted in the comments on the Light and Salt Learning YouTube page. And they had been working on multiplying polynomials. And then they were confused about how we write our answers to these kinds of problems and asked me this question and said, I thought that when we're simplifying algebraic expressions, the largest exponent comes first, then variables, ver then constants. But I'm seeing the answers written different ways. They basically say, so can you clarify for me? Can you help me to understand this a little better? The first thing I want to say to you who asked me the question and to everybody out there in internet land is please just breathe. This is actually one of those questions that I want to clarify because it's a good question and a lot of students have it, but the answer isn't actually as big of a deal as many of you might think. So which one is right? I mean, honestly, which one? Well, you know, what I always say is, um, whether you write a squared plus 5a plus 4b squared, or you write 4b squared plus a squared plus 5a, you've actually written the same. If you multiplied or added and subtracted and got this as an answer, neither one of these would be more right than the other. So let's talk about that a little bit. First, let's just relate it to English, to the way we speak. So for example, I can say, he goes to the store. This is a common English phrase. I can also say to the store he goes, and you might say, Kate, that sounds weird. And I would say to you, it might sound weird to you, but it's completely grammatically correct. There's nothing wrong with that sentence. I can say to the store he goes. The reason why it sounds weird to you is because you're probably a native English speaker, and that's not the way we usually say it or usually hear it. It's not the standard way we speak, but yet it's still a totally correct way. And I wouldn't need to correct someone who was speaking or writing that way. Now let's relate it to, to real life. I want you to take a look at this expression. What I'm saying here is I have three apples and see that plus sign? I have an orange and I have three bananas. And you guys, I can take that fruit, I can mix it up in the bowl, and it's going to be the exact same amount of fruit. You know, I could have the bananas and put those first in the bowl and talk about them first. I have three bananas. And then I could have the apples after that. And I have three apples. And then finally, I could put in the orange and I have an orange and it's not some new fruit amount. It's the same basic amount and who really cares what order they're in. It's the same thing in algebra, except instead of having groups of fruit, I have what I call terms, but it's the same idea here. The variable portion, the letter and its exponent work like the type of fruit. So this is an A squared, like our orange. It's, we just have an A squared. And no matter where I put it in our little bowl of fruit, we call this bowl of fruit a polynomial here. And it really doesn't matter as long as it's the same number of A squareds. And we can see here that we have, we're adding in an A squared, same thing here. Okay, and so that term checks. It might've moved places, but it's the same number of A squared. Now let's look at the next term. It says, and plus I have five A's, just like having five apples. Again, it won't matter where I move those in my fruit bowl, in this case, my polynomial. It's the same number of A's, like having the same number of apples. And so when I see it just move over here, I'm not worried about it. 
we have, again, we're adding, we have plus five apples. And then same thing here. What do I have here? I'm adding now to my bowl four B squared, it's like having four bananas. And if I want to go ahead and put those in my bowl first, it really doesn't matter what order I add the fruit into my bowl. It's the same exact bowl of fruit. This is the same exact polynomial. They're completely and totally equivalent. They are equal to each other. Now, I do have a warning with that. Students often, because they misunderstand minus signs, mess things up when we have negatives. Let's take a look. Let's start again with our fruit before we move into the world of algebra and look at what these mathematical phrases, these expressions are telling us here. So it starts with three bananas. And then we also have plus an orange, but then look at this minus sign. What does that mean in the context of fruit? Well, this is not something you have. Those plus signs represent something you have. If it's a minus, it's like you owe somebody some fruit. Maybe I ate someone else's fruit yesterday and I owe somebody three apples. So guys, I have three bananas and an orange in my bowl, but, mm, I owe someone three apples. Now that's a different scenario than the next. You guys have a tendency to move the fruit around the numbers and the letters and leave those signs staying still. But this next expression, this next phrase is a different scenario. This says I have an orange, yes. I had an orange before and I have an orange again. But take a look now, this says that I have three apples. That's real different than before when I owed somebody three apples. I hope you agree that having three apples in my hand is not the same thing as needing to pay back somebody some apples that I don't even have. You know, I'm gonna have to go find, go find a way to get some apples in order to pay this person back. It's just a different scenario. And then same thing here with the bananas. You know, there was no sign out front of these bananas here. So I can assume that those are bananas that I have. But here with the minus in front, well, no, those are bananas that I owe. I owe someone three bananas. Again, a different scenario. These two things, they're not equivalent. So what should the signs look like here? Well, take the sign with the groups of fruit in this case. Let's take a look. We have our orange. Our orange was positive or plus. Now it's not necessary to write that positive out front. I mean, you certainly could, but we always assume things are positive or that we have them when there's no negative sign. And mathematicians are lazy. We try never to write a symbol we don't need to. So you aren't likely to see that plus sign out in front. But as for the other ones, we need symbols in between so we know what's going on between these. So let's take a look. We're going to grab up the symbol that's with the apples because it tells us what's happening with the apples. No matter where I put them in my order of talking about them, I need to make sure that the apples are still something that I owe. They're still negative there or minusing. And then same thing with the bananas. It had no symbol out front, so it was positive bananas. It was some number of bananas I had, and so I will write a plus in front of the bananas. Again, watch out for your signs. They belong to the item that they're in front of. They don't just sit still while the items move around. But we got to get to the point, right? <laughs> your teachers are always talking about this standard form of a polynomial. Any of the GED math books out there on the market, they're probably going to bring up the standard form of a polynomial. You've heard me talking about it in my videos. You know, standard form, standard form, standard form. What are we all going on and on about? Well, two pieces of good news. The first piece of good news is it's way easier than it looks. Standard form isn't that big of a deal. But the second thing is uh, it's a college prep skill, not a GED skill. What we've already covered, being able to recognize when two things are equivalent, that's really as much as you need for the GED. If you never memorize what the standard form is and practice how to write things in the standard form, you will not get dinged or have a score effect on the GED. Because all you need to do is come up with your answer and then see which ones match on the answer key. So it'll be easy enough to just, oh, look, all my terms check with their terms. I'm right. However, in your college textbooks, 
you'll get problems that simply say, write this polynomial in standard form. They're trying to get you to uh, practice writing the normal way, again, not the correct way, the normal way mathematicians write it. So let's go ahead and just look at what standard form is. Not too bad. Standard form of a po polynomial has us ordering the terms from the highest degree to the lowest degree. Now, degree has to do with the exponents. And so a lot of students will just read this as, you know, the highest exponent to the lowest exponent. And that gets us so far. It, we can do, use that idea of it to do some simpler examples. So like, let's take a look at this one. Yes, when I talk about the degree, it does have to do with the exponents. If I were looking to put this polynomial in standard form, I would look for the term with the highest exponent, the highest degree of, in this case, p's. Well, I can see that's this very last one has that highest exponent. It has an exponent of five. And so it's got the highest degree. So that's going to be the first term that I write, p to the fifth. Now I'm bringing it out front. And remember, I'm a lazy mathematician, so I'm not going to bother to write that it's positive p to the fifth. We don't need plus signs at the beginning. We can assume that a number is positive unless otherwise told. And so we're done with this guy. And now that what's the next highest degree? Well, it's this third degree term. Notice me circling it with its minus sign. That minus on, sign belongs to the 9p cubed. And so as I move that over to go next in my lineup, I'm going to move that negative sign with me. Next one we see is a p squared. And that again, I take my sign with it. So it is a plus 7p squared. Now the next two don't have exponents. So you might wonder what the heck? Well, remember when you don't see an exponent on a variable here, in this case, it's P that we've been ordering, then it's just P to the first. It's We don't need to write an exponent because there's just a single solitary P. And so that is the next term we are gonna write the negative 5p, again, I'm taking its sign with it. And then the last thing we always write is the constant. It has zero p's, if you think about it. It's like negative 11 p to the zero. I mean, I'm I would never write that, but it has no p's, okay? And so it is the very last thing. And I used that language again. You do not need to know that language for the GED, but your math teachers are going to throw it around as if you already know it because we speak the language of math. So a plain old number without a letter on it is called a constant, which is the opposite, if you think about it, of a letter, which we call a variable. Variable means it can change. Constant means it stays the same. It does not change. This polynomial now is written in standard form. But the student who asked me this question is probably still a little mad at me because this is simpler than the ones he was asking me about. He was asking me about some tricky examples where it's not so clear which term has the highest degree. So let's take a look at this first question. What about when there are two or more variables? That seemed to be where he was sticky stuck a little bit. So what you need to realize is that the degree is not just an exponent. It's the sum of all the variables in a term's exponent. So for example, if I wanted to know the degree of this first term here, it has more than one letter, you know, more than one variable. It's seven, X to the seventh, Y, Z to the fourth. There's a lot going on here. How do I know what its degree is? Well, you just start adding. I have X to the seven. That in and of itself alone already has an exponent of seven and I need to sum them up. Now look at Y. Y does not have an exponent next to it, but careful, that's not a zero. But remember, if I had zero Y's, I wouldn't see it at all. If I just have a single solitary Y written down, Y count to one. So you see one Y there, that's a single Y. So that's an exponent of one. Some people will say the invisible exponent is one. You don't have to go that far, but that's the idea there. And then we can see that this is Z to the fourth power. 
So the degree of this term is not just a single exponent. The degree of this term is the sum of the exponents on all three of those variables. So that's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this is a 12th degree term. Now let's take a look at the next term. This next one has no x, no y, no z. This is a constant term. It's a zero with degree term. It's going to go last no matter what. Now let's look at this next term. Negative x, y squared, z cubed. The x has no exponent on it, so it has an invisible exponent of one. The y is squared, so we have an exponent of two. And the z is cubed. We have an exponent of three. And so one plus two plus three, we're looking at a sixth degree term. And then finally, let's consider this last term. x to the fifth, y to the second power, also called y squared, and a single solitary z means that we have an exponent of one there, and that's five, six, seven, eight. This is an eighth degree term. Okay, so we'll start with the highest degree. The highest degree was that first term. So it'll stay put right at the front here. Seven X to the seventh, Y, Z to the fourth. Second highest degree was our eighth degree term. So we'll put that next. And remember, we'll bring its sign with it. So plus 12 X to the fifth, y squared z. And then our next highest degree was our sixth degree term. And so we'll take that one next, again, bringing our sign with us, negative x, y to the second, z to the third. And finally, constant terms go last. They're basically a zero with a degree. They have no variables. So plus 15 is going to go at the end. And this is now written in standard form. Again, normal form, not right form, normal form. And then finally, one more question that my student touched on in his request was this, but what about when there are terms with the same degree? This is a very common type of answer that comes up when you're multiplying binomials. So you'll see things that look like this form a lot, but look at this. What degree is this term? Well, there's only x's and it's x to the second power. This is a second degree term. Look at the next term. There's two variables here, but they don't have any exponents. So this one's to the first, this one's to the first. One plus one is two. This term, the exponents sum to two. And so this is also a second degree, you know, and I should have circled the minus with it, sorry. And then this next term, minus four y squared. Again, we see a variable with an exponent of two and that's our only variable. This is also a second degree term. So what order do I write this in? And now again, this is not right or wrong. This is just normal that we'll start with the highest degree of the letters in alphabetical order. So in the alphabet, X comes before Y. So I'll just do that. I'll start with my highest degree of X. So this one was already written in the standard order. Starting with the highest degree of X is X squared. Then I have one with just a single solitary X. And then I have one with no X's at all. And I just used alpha order if my degrees are the same. But again, again, this is all just how we normally write things. You're learning to speak like a fluent mathematician. So you fit in in the math majors student lounge and you don't look like an outsider, okay? But no matter what order you write the terms in, you're not wrong. So if you have any questions about this or any other math concept, be sure to drop it in the comments and I'll do my best to answer it. I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody who's been so encouraging me lately with the coffee. Um, you have no idea how motivating it is to know that people are thankful for the work that I'm doing, thankful enough to come alongside me and support me financially. So to everyone who's given in the last few months, thank you. And thank you as well to all my patrons who give monthly and that commitment to support to light and salt learning. Super excited for all my teachers and trainings for the videos that I already have up for you guys. If you haven't checked them out yet, go check them out. And for the one that I am working on right now and about to 
put out that I'm excited about. And then all the ones that I have planned, I think that we are going to have so much fun learning together how to better serve struggling math students. And then to my patrons who just give and get nothing back, those at the light insult level at $15 a month, you all doing $9 a month at the sprinkle salt level and you at $3 a month in the shine a little light tier. I am just so thankful to all of you and your commitment and support.